The word potential is not an inherently negative word, but it's usually used of those who have actually accomplished nothing of any lasting significance in life. Have you noticed that? Most of the time when the word potential is used, it's used of someone who's actually done nothing. They have a lot of potential, but they've never actualized or realized that potential. Potential basically means something is useless right now, but it might be useful sometime later. Maybe in the distant future at some point. I had an uncle that collected old junk cars. And all those cars had the potential because he'd look at that car and he'd say, that's a window, it's worth this amount of money, a bumper's worth this, and there's all that potential right there, but who actually needs that kind of window, right? Potential is also used of those who do well, just not as well as they probably could have or as well as they probably should have. And if there's ever anyone that had great potential, it is Samson. Samson had great potential. And he did some outstanding, supernaturally miraculous things, but he could have been so much more. So we're going to talk about Samson tonight. We're going to be in Judges 13, 14, 15, a little bit of 16, and so much so that this is going to have to be two sermons. So we're going to look at Samson from two different sermons. But we're going to talk enough tonight where you get the idea. Samson, blessed of the Lord is the sermon title. There are five things that we want to look at through these chapters tonight with regard to Samson. And here's the first one. Let's talk about his parents. And parents play a huge role in the spiritual success of all children. We're going to give an explanation, a quick evaluation, and that's going to be the gist of this sermon. Look at me in Judges 13 and verse number 2. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah. So there's Samson's father's name right there, Manoah. And his wife was barren and bare not. Now, unless I overlooked it, I don't think the text reveals the name of Samson's mother. But we can tell a few things about him. And the first one we see is that at least his father was of the Danites. Now, Zorah was a city or a village located within the land allotment to the tribe of Dan. We've talked some about all the various tribes of Israel. There was good and bad moments throughout the history of the tribe of Dan, but ultimately they rebelled and became part of the northern kingdom of Israel, and they were taken and dragged away into Assyrian captivity in approximately 722 B.C. But we're also going to see with his parents, not only were they Danites, but they were also devoted people, and they were devoted to Jehovah. Look at Judges 13 and verse number 8. Then Manoah, that's Samson's father, entreated the Lord. Now, I think when we look at this verse and the next one, he prayed. This is a prayer. Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh, my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst send come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. He's admitting, look, I need some help as a parent. And it seems that he's praying to God Send this individual back, which we will see was an angel for sure, some supernatural being, and teach us what, how we're going to raise this promised child. Verse, voice number, or verse number nine, and God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. That seems that Manoah prayed, and he prayed acceptably, and God heard his prayer. God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Look at verse 19. If you don't know what a kid is, you might think this is a little strange. So Manoah took a kid. Now, that's a young goat. I, I refer to my three children as my kids, but they're not young goats. They're, they're children. What Manoah took here was a young goat, not a human, but a young goat. So Manoah took a kid, a young goat with a meat offering, and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord, and the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on. So despite living in what has to be considered an overall bad time of the Israelites' history, there were individuals who desired to please God, and Manoah was one of them. And it seems that he succeeded. Now, what's the evaluation for our lives? It's simply this one word, and it's commitment. Commitment. Parents need to realize their faithfulness 
plays a large role in whether or not their children will be faithful servants of the Lord. One of the best things that I can do for my children is to be committed to the gospel for life. Not a, a fair weather Christian, not a hot and cold, up and down, sporadic Christian. Attend well for a while and then not attend for a while. Come and go in and out, up and down. That does no favors. That does no justice to my children. None at all. So we as parents need to have that commitment to the truth to stick in there. And we need to encourage our children to do the same because tough times are coming. Now second. Let's talk about Samson and some promises associated with him. And realize this, God keeps his promises, will we? Now, the angel of the Lord visits Mrs. Manoah, whatever her name was, and makes various promises to her. And one in particular is Samson's birth. Look at Judges 13 and verse number 3. And the angel of the Lord, now it's beyond the scope of this study, but it would, it's very interesting to look at some of the various accounts about the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. And this could be one of the occasions where the angel of the Lord is a member of the Godhead. Now that's beyond the scope of this, but there are cases that could be made for that. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not but. Thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now this angel perhaps even a member of the Godhead. Angel here would be used in the sense of a messenger, not as a created being, but as a messenger, makes a promise here. It states the obvious, you're barren, but you're going to conceive and you're going to bear this child. And not only will this child, not only will you bear this child, but this child will be a son. Look in the same chapter, but verses 24 and 25. And the woman bare a son, just like, the angel of the Lord declared she would. The woman bare a son and called his name Samson. Samson means something along the lines of little son, as in S-U-N, son, or like the son. That is S-U-N, son. And the child grew, that's Samson, and the Lord blessed him. Verse 25 says, and the spirit of the Lord, that's the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord began to move him, to influence him, perhaps even supernaturally, at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtel. Now, there's also a promise associated with Samson that we're going to look at in Judges 13 and verse number 5. And look at what the wording is with regard to the promise. Look at Judges 13 and verse 5. For lo, this is the angel again speaking to Mrs. Manoah, whatever her name was. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. We'll talk about that momentarily. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. Now look at the promise. And he shall begin to deliver. So this wasn't going to be that Samson was going to totally eradicate the Philistines. It took some time. But the promise is he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And the Philistines continued to plague Israel up through the days of David. They were a well-organized, idolatrous, warmongering people. And they ended up being a thorn in Israel's side for a long period of time. So Samson got it started, but this continued on all the way through David's day. The evaluation for our lives is simply this word, and it is covenant. Jehovah is the covenant-keeping God, according to Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, and a host of other passages. Some of the Lord's covenants are conditional. That is, the Lord will do this if we do that. Some of the other covenants, you could call them of the Lord, are unconditional. Let me give you two illustrations. The rainbow is an unconditional covenant. No matter how good we act, no matter how bad we act, God has promised without conditions that the entire earth will never be destroyed again by water. So every time we look up and see a rainbow in the sky, we can know God is going to keep his promise. What's the promise? He's never going to destroy the entire earth by water ever again. However, 
where some of our religious friends make a mistake is that salvation is conditional. There are conditions that must be met in order for God to keep his promise. Let me give you one that's very plain. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now do you see there are conditions associated with that promise? But he that believeth not shall be damned. So when it comes to the salvation of the soul, is the Lord going to keep his covenant? Well, yes. But when it comes to our eternal salvation, is it conditional or is it unconditional? It's conditional. We have to do what the Lord says. And when we do what the Lord says, he's going to keep his promise. Now third, let's talk about Samson and again with some particulars associated with him. Now, you'll see what I mean by this. It's difficult to say whether or not all parts of the Nazarite vow were required of Samson or not. But what I can show you is that some of them were at least required initially of his mother. Look at Judges 13 and verse 4. This is the angel of the Lord speaking to Samson's mother. We don't, the text doesn't reveal her name. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, Samson's mother, and drink not wine... We'll see that's either fresh or fermented, no, no fruit of the vine, nor strong drink. That would be what we consider alcoholic beverages. And eat not any unclean thing. So she had to follow at least part of the Nazarite vow, what would be considered the Nazarite vow herself. Look also at verse 14. She, that's Samson's mother, may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine. Now that seems to imply what we would consider a grape vine. Neither let her drink wine, either fresh or fermented, or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. So Samson's mother, to some degree, whatever you want to call it, Nazarite vow or not, that's what she had to do. She had to keep some of it. But we already read in verse number 5 that Samson was to be a Nazarite, a separated one, unto God. But look at... Judges 13 and verse number 7. But he said unto me, this is Samson's mother speaking, it seems, to her husband Manoah. He said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, that's Samson, and now drink no wine, fresh or fermented, nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for, here's why, the child, we know as Samson, shall be a Nazarite to God. Now here's what's interesting. From the womb to the day of his death. So Samson was to be a perpetual Nazarite. Numbers 6 gives at least four requirements of the Nazarite vow. Number one, there was no wine. That means nothing fresh, nothing fermented. No grape juice, no fermented alcoholic wine, nothing from the grapevine it seems. Number two, no strong drink. That means... Nothing that we would consider an, an intoxicating beverage at all. Number three, no razor should come upon his head. That means don't cut the hair. And then number four, touch no dead body. What seemed to be implied in that dead body was a human body. Now, were all four of those required of Samson? I'm telling you, I don't know. I know one for sure was. One for sure. No doubt about it. And that was that no razor was to come upon his head. Now, were the others required of him? I don't know. But here's the evaluation for our life, and it's simply this. It's commandments. God does not have to give us a reason for anything. You know, some people say, why, did, why would God tell us to repent and be baptized? Who cares? It's not up to us to sit and say, why did he tell us to do it? That's not what we're to do. We're simply to go out and do exactly as God has told us without question. We don't ask God why. Why did God tell Saul to kill all the Amalekites and utterly smite them? Who cares? God told him what to do and that's what he was supposed to do. He hasn't told you and me to go smite the Amalekites and utterly destroy them, but he has told us to be thou faithful unto death. So what do we do? We go do what the Lord has told us and we don't ask why. Now number four. Let's talk about Samson, and now let's discuss some of his problems. And it really is sad when our biggest problems come from within. You know who Samson's worst enemy was? 
Samson, unfortunately. Samson had great potential, and he had big problems throughout his life. But some of his problems were self-induced. And probably the first thing that would come to any of our minds with thinking about Samson and problems is women. Samson had problems with women, and we're not even going to touch the hem of the garment with Delilah. We'll do that later. But he had problems long before Delilah ever came on the scene. Look with me in Judges 14, beginning in verse number 1. The text says, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Paul's problem right there. There's a problem right there. Big problem right here. No, no, no. Verse number 2. And he came up and told his father and mother and said, I've seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Meaning, I've seen this beautiful woman of the daughters of the Philistines. I've made up my mind. That's who I want. Now, mom and dad are going to try to talk some sense into it. Verse number three, then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? Out of all the people that you know, out of all the people around here, you're going to go find a Philistine of all the people? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me. He's not going to listen. For she pleaseth me well. Verse number four is very interesting. But his father and his mother knew not that it was of Jehovah, that it was of the Lord, that he, now the question would be who's he here? It seems like it would be Jehovah, but perhaps it's Samson, but it's probably the Lord himself, that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So what do we see here? Even, this is a good example of God's providence. With God's providence, he does not override the free moral agency of man. There's no indication from the text that the Lord wanted Samson to do this. But despite Samson doing and making the request that he wanted, God's overruling providence was still going to be able to work this out despite what Samson made up in his mind that he wanted to do. Look at verses 15 through 17. I would suggest that you read Samson's riddle and what he does there, and we'll touch on some of that in just a second. But verse number 15, we'll see that Samson would give in to pressure from women. Verse number 15, and it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife. Now, they were definitely betrothed, and I suppose in some degree they were married. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband that he may declare unto us the riddle, lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. How do you like that? We're going to figure out what this means, or we're going to burn you and your father's house. Have ye called us to take that we have? Is it not so? And verse 16, Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou dost but hate me and lovest me not. Thou hast put forth a riddle unto the children of, now look here, of my people. Now who were her people? The Philistines. And hast not told it me. And he, Samson, said unto her, his Philistine, apparently wife, have I not told it my, and behold rather, I have not told it my father nor my mother, and shall I tell thee? Verse 17, and she wept before him the seven days, while their feast lasted, and it came to pass on the seventh day that he told her. He gave in to the pressure of a woman. Because she lay sore upon him, and she told the riddle to the children of who? Of The text says her people, the Philistines. Now, look at Judges 16 and verse number 1. We'll see that Samson had a problem with promiscuity. If you don't know what that means, ask your daddy. Judges 16 and verse 1, Then went Samson to Gaza, or Gaza, and there saw an harlot, and went in unto her. So would you say that Samson had some problems in his life? Yeah. He had some problems, and women were one of his problems, but he also had problems with his kindred. Go with me back to Judges 15, and let's look at verses 9 through 13. Now, when you read this, you're probably going to ask yourself the same thing I did. Why wouldn't they rally behind Samson and go stomp out the Philistines? Well, I don't know. I really can't answer that. 
Judges 15 and verse 9, Then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why are ye come up against us? Meaning, why are you here messing with us? And they answered, To bind Samson are we come up, to do to him as he hath done to us. Don't worry, we'll figure out what Samson's done here directly. Then, now count it, 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock Etam, or Etam, and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? Don't you know you're not in charge, Samson? We understand you're the judge of Israel, but the Philistines rule over us. What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, as they did unto me, so have I done unto them. And to some degree that's true. Verse number 12, and they said unto him, We are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. Now, did I read that right? Here his brethren, men, 3,000 of the men of the tribe of Judah, have come to take him to the Philistines. Now, why would they do that? Why wouldn't they take that 3,000 in Samson and say, Boys, let's go in this. <laughs> Let's go solve this problem because Samson can handle himself. And surely 3,000 of us can do something. Well, that's not how it worked out. And Samson, verse 12, said unto them, Swear unto me that you will not fall upon me yourselves. Meaning, don't, don't, y'all don't get me out here and try to kill me. Verse 13, And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand. But surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. Now, how would you, how would you feel about that? If your own brethren delivered you to your enemies, that would kind of hurt, and that would be a problem. And you know the point that we can see here is there can be misplaced solace in servitude. There can be blindness in bondage, which is foolishness. What the men of Judah should have done is said, look, let's go down here. We'll take our 3,000 and Samson, who was literally a one-man army, and let's stop this. Let's rally against these people. But they were happy in slavery, so to speak. They were content in their servitude, and they said, Look, the Philistines who rule over us have asked for Samson. Uh, well, that's just what we'll do. We'll give them Samson. That's a problem. But his problem also, Samson's problem, was with the Philistines. Go back to Judges 13 and verse 1. The Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil again. See that cycle throughout the book of Judges? Again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. Sin, servitude, supplication, salvation, satisfaction. And that satisfaction didn't go on to more and more sanctification, did it? It led right back to sin every single time. Look also with me at Judges 15 and verse number 6. And you'll see some of the problems that Samson had with the Philistines. Judges 15, 6, then the Philistines said, Who had done this? We'll see what this is in a moment. And they answered Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. Whoa. See that? His daddy, his father-in-law, gave his wife to what we would consider his best man at his wedding. But that's not even the point, really, of this verse. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. They burned Samson's wife and his father-in-law to death. The Philistines burned other Philistines. That's a mean bunch, wouldn't you say? So Samson had a big problem with the Philistines. And Judges 15 and verse 20 indicates that Samson's 20 years of judging Israel occurred during the Philistines' 40 years of oppression. So it seems that Samson came along the line about the halfway point and then probably ended it out because we'll see what happened to Samson next time we come together. The evaluation for our life is simply this word, and it is complications. Even when we live soberly, righteously, and godly, there will be problems. Even when we do our best to do right, complications are going to arise and we have to learn to work through the complications and remain committed. Samson had problems in his life. Some of them were not his fault. Some of them were. Isn't that true with us? We have complications and problems in our life, but if we're really honest and we begin to evaluate them, how many of them are self-induced? Far too many. But even the ones that aren't self-induced, we still have problems. What's the point? Complications are going to happen. We have to stay committed. Now, number five. And I think this is basically what everybody wants to hear about Samson. Let's talk about his power. 
And imagine if a five-talent individual pushed themselves to the limit. You ever thought about that? Imagine if an individual who's been abundantly blessed by God actually went out and maximized their potential. Perhaps Samson possessed a degree of natural strength, but there's no doubt that the Spirit of the Lord provided him with supernatural empowerment. And I want to give you quickly six different occasions where Samson showed his power. And it's obviously through the power of God. Go with me back to Judges 14. And let's look at Judges 14, verses 5 and 6. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion. The idea of a young lion is this is a lion at its peak of strength. Not necessarily an immature lion, but a lion who is in the prime of its life. A young lion roared against him. So here's a lion. Now, if a lion were to come against me, I'm in trouble. All right? I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what you do with a lion. Run, play dead. I don't know, but I'm in big trouble. All right? Verse number six, Samson had a little help. And the Spirit of the Lord, that's the Holy Spirit, came mightily upon him, and he rent him. Samson tore that young lion apart. He ripped that thing into pieces as he would have rent a kid. Now, what's a kid? It's a young goat, not a child, okay? He, he ripped that line, that young line apart as he would have rent a kid and he had nothing in his hand. So he did it with his two hands. There's a line in the prime of its strength and Samson goes over there and tears the thing to pieces. That's amazing. But he told not his father or his mother what he had done. All I know to say is, wow. I, I, I don't know what to, to say else about that. Look in the same chapter, but verses 19 and 20. And the Spirit of the Lord, you'll see this several times throughout Samson's life. Supernatural, miraculous influence of the Holy Spirit. In Samson's case, it usually was supernatural strength. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them. Here's one man who kills 30 probably trained killers of the Philistines. And took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion. Best man in his wedding I reckon. Whom he had used as his friend. So all I know to say to that is wow. Here's one man who goes and kills 30 trained killers. That's pretty tough. But look with me in Judges 15 verses 4 and 5. This is also amazing. Verse number four, and Samson went and caught 300 foxes, 300 foxes, perhaps the idea is also of jackals, but the text says foxes, and took firebrands or torches and turned tail to tail. It looks like he tied their tails together in some capacity. I don't know how you'd do that without the, I mean, it, it, a tougher man than I am, I can tell you that. Turned tail to tail and put a firebrand or a torch in the midst between, in the midst between two tails and when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn, the idea is grain of the Philistines, and burn up both the shocks and also the standing corn or grain with the vineyards and the olives. Now, this is a major blow to the Philistine economy, wouldn't you say? So here Samson's causing all kinds of problems for them. And look how he's doing it. That's by supernatural power, little doubt about it. Look at verses 7 and 8 of chapter 15. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, burnt his wife and her father with fire, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And he smote them. Now this is a figure of speech. He smote them hip and thigh. That means Samson utterly, totally, mercilessly stomped these people. Smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock, Etam. Look in the same chapter. Look at Judges 15, verses 14 and 15. Here's probably we're all familiar with, and the only thing I know to say about this is wow. Judges 15 and verse number 14. And when he came unto Lehi, this is Samson, the Philistines shouted against him. This is, recall, where those 3,000 men of Judah have delivered him unto the Philistines, and he said, look, that's fine, but don't y'all kill me. And they said, look, we won't kill you. We're going to bind you up, and we're going to take you to the Philistines. So remember that. The Philistines shouted against him and something happened. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire and his hands 
loosed from off, and his bands rather, loosed from off his hands. Meaning however they had him tied up, when he just flexed out, it was all gone. He busted it all to pieces. Now, most of us are probably familiar with this. And he, that Samson, found a new jawbone of a donkey. Apparently right where this happens, he looks down by the providence of God, however you want to explain it. Here's a dead donkey. He reaches down, rips that thing's jawbone away from its head, which is about what he did, put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith. That means he reached down, ripped that jawbone of a donkey off. There's a thousand Philistines who are coming to kill him, one against a thousand at least. And the text says he slew a thousand men therewith. That is amazing. That even beats what we read about Shamgar. Shamgar, I say only, Shamgar only killed 600 with an ox goad. Well, here Samson killed 1,000 with the jawbone of a donkey. One more. Look at me in Judges 16 and verse number 3. I find this amazing. This is amazing to me. This is good stuff. Judges 16 and verse 3. And Samson lay till midnight and arose at midnight and now look at this. Took the doors of the gate of the city and the two bar posts. Meaning he looked out there at the gate of this city and he ripped the gates of the city off. He engine everything. Now, I don't know how much these things would have weighed and it really doesn't matter. But in your mind, they're designed to keep out armies. They're designed to keep people out. Samson says, you know what? I'm going to show you. He goes and rips them off the hinges, hinges and all. <laughs> and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. Now remember, he's already laid with a harlot in Gaza. So he's in Gaza, and Hebron is about 40 miles away. Now the text says he carried it up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. Now I don't know how close he got to Hebron, but it seems he not only ripped them off, hinges and all, but carried them several miles up to the top of the hill and said, there you go. Come up here and get to the doors to your gate there. See how you like that. All I know to say to that is, wow. That's just amazing. And what's the point behind all this? The Spirit of the Lord is working through him mightily to show the Philistines, look, you can't handle my servant. There's no way you can handle me. That's the point behind this. And the evaluation for our life is simply this, capabilities. Brethren, there is a power working through us. It's not supernatural. You're not going to be able to, to do anything of the supernatural things that Samson did, and neither am I. But the Bible teaches in Ephesians 3.20, there is a power that works in us, and that power is the gospel. We need to look at ourselves as we are servants of the Lord, and we can do something. We, can, we cannot do everything but we can do some things, and that's all we need to do is the best that we can. Everyone in this assembly has the potential to accomplish great things for the Lord. But I'm going to give you a sad but true statement. Only a handful, if any, if any, will actually realize and implement their potential in the gospel as a member of the Lord's church. We all could do great things, but how many people actually do something? Just a small handful. Everyone, in view of that, has the potential to inherit eternal life. And those who attain it are those who fully obey Jesus. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation Unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Have you obeyed Jesus? Let's see. Hear the truth. Acts 18, 8. Believe the truth. Acts 16, 31. Repent of sin. Acts 17, 30. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God. Acts 8, 37. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins. Acts 2, 38. Brethren, Acts 8, 22 is still in the Bible. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. We're here because we love you, but you have to come. Do so now as together we sing and as we sing the song of encouragement.